Our Father, we bless your name for this great privilege to gather before you, to be commissioned by you again, to be challenged to service, and to see the very heart cry of our Father God and his desire and his great concern for darkness that covers the hearts of men and for the possibility of introducing Jesus Christ, the light of the world, to shine in the hearts of men so the, the darkness in the hearts of men will vanish away. Father, we are asking as you are calling us, challenging us and commissioning us today to reach out to the lost, to recover them into the kingdom of God. We are asking that you empower us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Write your word upon our hearts. As we have heard from our singers, that if we will fight for God and for righteousness, we must fight and must never look back. We must not allow anything, whatever it may be, to draw us back. And Father, we pray that themselves and ourselves will do it without allowing discouragement in the name of Jesus. And Father, we are asking that the great commission you have given us, we shall accomplish it in the name of Jesus. Speak to us this evening. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Tonight, we are deviating from our regular systematic study of the Acts of Apostles. We're examining the great commission that Jesus Christ gave to the church before he went away. And you'll find it recorded in five different places. You have it at the end of Matthew, the end of Mark, the end of Luke, the end of John, and the beginning of Acts of the Apostles. But we shall be closely examining the records as written in Matthew and Mark. I have titled the teaching for tonight, More Work for Jesus. Listen to this songwriter. This is where I got the subject of what you are talking about tonight. It's in the songbook, Bronma Hymnal 55. It says, one more day's work for Jesus. One less of life for me. But then, heaven will be nearer, Christ will be dearer. Than yesterday to me, his love and light fill all my soul tonight. Yes, one more day's work for Jesus. And how sweet the work has been. To tell the story. To show the glory where Christ flocks enter in, how it did shine in this poor soul or heart of mine. One more day's work for Jesus, oh yes, it may be a weary day, but heaven shines clearer and rest comes nearer at each step of the way, and Christ in all, before his face I fall. Oh, blessed work for Jesus. So rest at Jesus' feet, there toil seems pleasure. My wants a treasure, and pain for him is sweet. Lord, if I may, I'll serve another day. And then the chorus says, one more day's work for Jesus. Yes, one more day's work for Jesus. One more day's work for Jesus and then one less of life for me. Which means the more we think about Jesus Christ, the more we work for him, the more we are occupied for the work of the Lord, the less we are occupied for ourselves. And you know, in Jesus giving us the great commission, he has shown us a wonderful example, a supreme example of the successful soul winner. You know what he said? He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And Paul the Apostle told us that Jesus Christ came to save the sinners of whom I am chief. The motive behind everything Jesus did, everything that Jesus did, the motive behind it, was to prepare hearts for the experience of salvation to bring men into right relationship to god think about it the healing he did the feeding of the crowds that he did and also the preaching of the gospel everything he did it was to make people to have the salvation of their souls and you know everything we're doing at this time of the retreat the publicity 
the feeding of uh, the crowds, the praying for those who need prayer, the counseling for those who inquire after counseling, the preaching of the gospel, uh, the teaching of Bible study, the singing of the choir, the cooking at the kitchen. Everything we're doing at the retreat time is for one purpose. And listen to me, it is to lead people into the experience of salvation, bringing men and women into right relationship unto God. And if you check up in Matthew chapter 12, I want to show you six things there before I get into the real study. Matthew chapter 12, from verse 10 to verse 21. Jesus Christ worked and served and won multitudes to the Lord in an atmosphere of hatred, antagonism, and hostility. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 10, And behold, there was a man which had a son withered, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on, on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? You see what surrounded him? Accusation, opposition, persecution, misunderstanding, misrepresentation, the attack of the devil. There was a man that had his hand withered, and they knew that Jesus Christ will want to heal as a prelude to wanting to save his soul. And therefore they were asking him, so that they might accuse him, is it lawful, is it right to do good, to heal the sick on the Sabbath day? And he said unto them, What man is there among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into the pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath day. I'm asking you a question. Is it right? Is it lawful to disturb people? Remove them from their houses? Take them away from the picnic and the festival of the Easter period and tell them to get to a location somewhere. And then heal them, preach to them, feed them. Is it lawful to bring them out of the conveniences of their houses, out of the luxury of their beds at night, into a location somewhere where they may not have all the, all the conveniences and luxury they have at home? On Easter period, at Easter period, it is lawful to do right during Easter time or Sabbath day or any period to preach the gospel to the people, to show them the light, to win them from darkness. It is lawful to do it. And in verse 13, then he said to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And it stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. Then the Pharisees went out, and he held a counsel against him, how they might destroy him. But Jesus knew it. When Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him. And he healed them all. Let me comment on that verse a little. You know, last Monday and the Monday before, I told you seven principles to observe during persecution. And you know, when you study the life of Jesus Christ, it's so wonderful and beautiful. I want to assure you something. Jesus Christ was never a coward. If you want to see who a bold man is, if you want to see who an authoritative captain is, look at him when he faces the devil. And you see Jesus Christ in the wilderness. And the devil came, and you can see he stood at his full strength and power and stature. And he told of the devil. And he told him, you must worship God and God alone. By no means was Jesus Christ a coward. But then I told you the Sunday before, blessed are the peacemakers, the peace lovers. They shall be called the children of God. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was a peace lover, a peacemaker. And with all the hatred, antagonism, hostility, opposition, persecution, and all the people that surrounded him, you know, if he wanted to face them and challenge them, he could. 
But then Jesus Christ, because he loved peace, he withdrew himself. Why? Was it because he feared death? Oh no, he said, for this cause was I born. Was it because he feared what the people could do? No, he said, the greater than Solomon or Jonah, the greater than all the Old Testament people is here. Was it because he feared what those people will do? Never, never. He stayed with them at the age of 12 and he talked senses into them. Why then did he withdraw himself? You know, the crowd, the multitude followed after him. And if he confronted those people in the open, the multitude could stone those Pharisees. And because of that, as a peace lover, as a peacemaker, he withdrew himself. And the multitude followed him. And he healed them all. And charged them that they should not make him known. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. You see that? Behold my servant, whom I have chosen. My beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. And he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive. He shall not strive. A righteous preacher does not strive. A righteous preacher does not bring commotion. A righteous preacher will not set a, a particular part of society against another part of society. A righteous preacher will not use either his tongue or his hand or his pen or his language or his influence in society to cause confusion and to disturb peace. He shall not strive, nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory, and is in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Listen to me. Six things I want you to particularly take note of in the life of Jesus Christ. One, his appointment. You know, he was appointed by God the Father. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen. He was appointed by God. Number two, his approval. My beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. Appointed by God, approved by God. And then his anointing, I will put my spirit upon him. That's why he was a successful soul winner. That's why he was a successful proclaimer anywhere he went, everywhere he went, whatever surrounded him, wherever he walked, wherever he moved, he was successful. Not only that, his approach, very simple, very peaceful, and very winsome. The most attractive person that ever lived in the spirit, the most influential person that ever lived, his words were simple and soothing. If he spoke to little children, their hearts rested in the bosom of his faith. If he spoke to people on the stormy sea, the sea became calm and their hearts rested. If he laid his hands on the shoulder of a man that was bent low, the shoulder came up in the assurance of the power of his faith. If he, if he confronted a leper who had been cast away from society, that leper will be cleansed immediately and joy and satisfaction will come to his soul and come to his family. Anywhere he went on the mountainside, anywhere he went on the seashore, anywhere he came in the house, on the housetop, anywhere there was still simple approach and peaceful approach and winsome approach. Not only that, you know there was such an assurance within him. He moved with dignity. He talked with authority. Anywhere he went, evil spirits recognized him. And they said, what have we to do with you? You are the son of the most high God. There was an assurance that, you know, gave poise and positiveness to his uh, dealing with men and women. You know what? He was very confident of the outcome before he ever started. 
You know, Jesus never approached anyone concerning salvation. He knew the end before the beginning. Before he started preaching, he knew that people will get saved. Before he prayed for the sick, he knew that the person will get healed. Before he approached a demon-possessed person, there was an assurance of faith, an assurance in his life that he knew the outcome before the beginning of the battle. And not only that, there was, you know, such a radiance and such a reality in the Savior's life and faith that called the people to accept him. For the Bible says, in his name shall the Gentiles trust six things about jesus christ that made him a successful soul winner that made him the appointed person of god that made him the fruit bearer that he was number one is appointment number two is um, is approval number three is anointing number four is approach then is assurance and then is acceptance and i'm telling you something as we approach the retreat work you need to have these six parts within you and the first one you need to have within you is the appointment of God. And in John chapter 15, verse 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. My brother, my sister, remember that always. You are appointed by God. Never forget it. Whatever you are called to do, if you are the first time preacher at the retreat, before you face the crowd, there will be a slight fear in your heart. The fear is, well, will I be able to face the crowd? Will I be able to discharge my duty? Will I be able to, you know, spend 30 minutes and stand on my feet and declare the truth of God to the people? There will be fear inside your heart. But remember this one single fact. You are appointed by God for that hour to give that message. You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. You know, if you are singing for the first time, it is not a small thing for members of the choir to come up here and face thousands of people go and ask any of them the first time they came on the platform here and they face the crowd they'll be shaking there'll be fear now am i dressed well am i opening my mouth well those exercises they taught us on wednesday when we we're practicing am i pronouncing the words well is it the or the before a vowel or before a consonant you see, there'll be the fear there. There'll be the, the thing that makes you to feel you may not be doing it the right way. Am I, am, I have, am I standing right? Am I doing it well? Am I just off pitch? But then understand that whatever you are called to do at the retreat time, this is the thing that gives you confidence. You are appointed by God. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Don't fear making a mistake. Just trust in the Lord because he has appointed you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit. That your fruit should remain and that whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Number two, remember something. The approval of God. You must have that approval upon your life. And you know you can have the approval of God upon your life. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 second timothy chapter 2 verse 15 study to show thyself approved unto god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly properly dividing the word of truth jesus had number one appointment divine appointment and you, are, you know you ought to have that. And you know you have that already if you are born again. Jesus has chosen you, selected you, and he has uh, appointed you. Number two, you know you ought to be approved of God. And you have a part to play in being approved of God. You study, you endeavor, you make all the necessary preparation to have yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. You know, if you are not well prepared, you'll be ashamed. If you are given a message to preach, you must get all the help you can. Look at that topic you are given. And if there is any cassette, remember that we have preached before relating to that subject, get it. 
If there is any outline we have published before concerning that subject, get it. If, take out your concordance and take out your Bible and look through the cross references and get on your knees and ask the Lord, Oh Lord, come and give spiritual food to the people. As you are preparing, preparing the message and preparing in prayer and preparing, the, if you are singing, you practice well. That's your preparation. And then in all that preparation, you are studying, endeavoring to make yourself approved unto God. So that whatever you do, you will not come to shame. You will not be ashamed because you have not been thoroughly prepared. Number three, the anointing. Jesus had the anointing upon him. And uh, in various parts of the Bible, the children of God are promised the anointing. You know, if you are born again, the Bible says, He that does not have the Spirit of Christ is none of his. If you are born again, you have the Spirit of God. I've told you that before. And then as you move on in the Lord, the more you pray, the more you get into deeper Christian experiences like sanctification and the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the more anointing you have. But then let me tell you something. The believer has anointing. Listen to me very well. The believer has anointing, but the power of the anointing only comes out at the time of duty. You know, we are anointed by God And the anointing is there And the Bible says that the unction that is in you It abides Or the anointing remains upon you But the manifestation of the power of that anointing Only comes out at the time of duty If you fold your hand If you close your mouth If you tie your legs If you sleep on the bed If there is never any activity upon you The power in the anointing will never come out you are appointed by God. You are approved of God. And then you are anointed by the Spirit of God. But then it's only when, you're, when you come out in duty, in responsibility, and you are really doing what the Lord has called you to do, that the power of that anointing will come out. In First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Verse 20. But ye have an unction. The word, the Greek word there is translated anointing in another place. In fact, in the same chapter. Ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received abideth in you. The anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And if you want more of that anointing to show forth, in power then you become more prayerful and you you become more yielded to the spirit's control the next point i'm making concerning all that we're doing during the retreat is our approach appointed by god so you are approved of god so you must endeavor to be anointed by the spirit of god so you are as a child of god now how about your approach keep it simple Keep it simple. You know, my brother, if you have gone to university and you have learned those uh, vocabularies uh, from your lecture room, and you, now, you are a Christian, you are a child of God, now you are called to preach the gospel. What's your approach? You are not speaking to colleagues who are lecturers. You are not speaking to managers like yourself. You are not speaking to bank officials. You are not speaking to people who are high up, who have learnt all the vocabularies of technology and science and medicine and engineering and whatever you have. You are speaking to people who are saying, show me Jesus. Show me the simple gospel. Show me how, can, how I can be saved. How I can repent. What it means to repent. Show me the power of Christ's resurrection. Show me how I can pray. How I can touch heaven. How I can have the grace of God upon my life. I don't speak great, great vocabulary. Be simple. That's the approach. And you know, when you, when you preach the gospel, you must approach it in such a simple manner. Let me show you something. You know the trees that are very tall and very big are useless to the generality of people when it comes to picking fruit. But the tree that has the branches low, 
for the children to raise up their hands and pluck the fruit. Those are the trees that attract children. The tall trees, some big trees with high branches, and the, the fruits are far, far, far away. They never attract the attention of children. And if you are a child of God, you are, good, you are a preacher of the gospel, let your approach be simple enough so you will be the tree whose branches are very low so that everybody in the retreat will be able to just stretch forth their hand and they'll be plucking fruit of righteousness from your tree. Be simple. Be winsome. You know, in your dressing, keep neat. You are singing in the choir, keep neat. You are an usher in the, at the retreat, keep neat. Wash your clothes, iron your clothes, and have a presentable personality when you are singing or preaching. You are at the prayer section, at the prayer room, and you are casting out devils. Speak clean language. You know, it's not the big vocabulary that drives away the devil. It's the simplicity of faith that drives away the devil. So in your approach as a prayer warrior, your approach as a preacher, your approach in singing, your approach in counseling, your approach in leading the Bible study, be simple, be winsome, and be peaceful. And then, have assurance within you. You know, when a preacher comes on, you, you can know whether he has assurance within him or not. The way he introduces his subject, if he's apologetic, the people knows, they, they know that he has no assurance within him. If he's, you know, cowardly, if he does not know the basis or the foundation of what he's preaching about, the people can tell. But when a man of assurance comes to preach, the gospel is beaming out of his face. And he's standing erect because he knows he has the assurance within him that the power of god will come out that the gospel is the gospel of power he knows that the gospel is preaching is the power of god and therefore it's not preaching with shame it's not preaching as a coward the righteous is as bold as a lion therefore have this definite assurance within you it will give poison and positiveness to you when you're dealing with men or when you are preaching or whatever you are doing Look at um, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And see a preacher like yourself. As opening the Bible to get Romans chapter 1, let me remind you of Paul the Apostle. He was a murderer, he was a persecutor, he was an injurious fellow, he was a blasphemer. Uh, do you know when he started preaching? The very day that Ananias came to him and told him, Brother Saul, the Lord that appeared to you in the way, uh, that appeared to you on the way to Damascus, he has sent me that your eyes will be opened and that you will be baptized in the Holy Ghost. It was that very time that he started preaching the gospel. And, and the people were surprised and they said the, the person that has come in here to persecute the people the person that has been making a havoc destroying the church I is preaching now the faith which wants he persecuted but let me tell you something Paul the apostle approached his preaching with boldness and assurance why? Romans chapter 1 verse 16 for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ don't preach as if you are ashamed. Don't sing as if you are shy and you are ashamed of who you are singing for. Don't stand as an usher as if you, are you want to cover your face, you want to cover your identity, you don't want anybody to know you. Be bold and be, have the assurance, be happy with what you are doing. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it takes the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from face to face, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then, lastly, let the reality of your life, let it be so clear that people will find it easy to accept you and accept your message you know if you are phony just on the surface a, a counterfeit if you are not real 
you will not be accepted by people. You know, there is a way you can smile and grin. And people will know that you are just putting it on on the surface. It's not real in your heart. There is a way you can say, praise the Lord. And people will know it is coming out of the depths of your heart. There is a way you can say, praise the Lord. And people will know that you have family trouble with your wife. But, uh, well, you are commanded to say, praise the Lord. And therefore, you have to say it. But let everything you say, you are leading the choir, or you are leading the announcement, or you are making any announcement, whatever you are doing, let there be a reality, a ring of reality in all that you do, that people who see you and who hear you will say, Oh God, what you have given to this man, give it to me. That when you sing, there will be such a reality. They know that the meaning of the song you are singing is so deep within you. And it is coming out of you. The singing may not be perfect, but you will know that you are singing out of a perfect heart. And the radiance of the face of Jesus. No wonder the Bible calls him the son of righteousness. S-U-N. Because everywhere he went, there was that bright, shining glory of the radiance of his face. And it compelled the people to have the trust in him. And so, as you go, remember that if you will have acceptance with people, if you will have acceptance uh, with the people you are preaching to, you are singing to, there must be that radiance and reality in your faith and in your life. And in everything that you do, that will make them to accept what you say, what you do. Six things I've told you about Jesus, which must be present in your life as you are ministering during the retreat. Number one, the appointment God's appointment you are appointed already number two approval coming from God so must you be approved number three the anointing number four the approach simple winsome peaceful then the assurance and then the acceptance very briefly I'll talk to you on the task the target the travail and the triumph in the work of soul winning what's the task we have as Christians the sage. Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading from verse 18. Our task as Christians. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And I have an amen from you. Amen. The task we have as Christians. Uh, you know, we're not going to the retreat to play. Or, you know, just to have another occasion. Or just to have a religious event. Or just to have the yearly ceremony. We're going to the retreat ground because of the great commission that Jesus Christ has given to us as part of the church. And the task we have as Christians is that we want to win the lost to Christ. He himself said, go and teach when you teach them, you will bring forth faith within them. They will repent and turn from their sins and then they will call upon me. I will save them and then they will be ready for water baptism. In Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the gospel to every creature. You know something? We're not going to the retreat to clap. The retreat is not just clapping hands, singing songs, eating food, entertaining one another. No, it's not for entertainment. It's not for feasting. It's to preach the gospel to every creature that comes to the retreat. And so you preachers, camp commandants, zona leaders, listen to me. The task you have is to so explain the gospel, is to so emphasize the gospel, 
is to so make the gospel plain to everybody at the retreat ground that everybody will know what it means that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose up for our justification that if we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that, that God raised him from the dead on our behalf, we shall be saved. It's to make it so clear how they can repent, how they can turn to the Lord, how they can call upon the Lord, how they can give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to entertain, no. Everything that Jesus did, I told you before, feeding the crowds, healing the sick, preaching to the people. He did so that the people will understand what it means to come to the Lord. He said, I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the task. That's the reason we're having the retreat in Acts chapter 2. Reading from verse 37. Acts 2. Verse 37, now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now suppose you sing. What's your task? is to raise up the question in the heart of the hearers. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Suppose you are serving food. Why do you serve the food at the retreat with such a smile on your face, such a radiance in your life, such, a, such cleanness and neatness upon your dress, and such a wonderful language in your mouth? Why do you have all that when you are merely serving food? is to make the people you are giving the food to, to look at you and to see the life of Christ and the face of Christ within you until they'll be saying, what shall we do to be able to have what that person has? You know, you clean up the surrounding at the retreat ground and you do it so much that the people that go around, they see you walking for the Lord and they are so challenged and they are running after you. They are saying, uh, the way you walk for the Lord, the way you just give yourself to the service of the Lord and clean the surrounding. Uh, what can I do to be like you? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then the preacher will come up to explain to the people what they will do. To repent and to give their lives to the Lord. Listen to me. The retreat is not just to teach doctrine. The retreat is to show the life of Christ, the suffering of Christ, the burial of Christ, the betrayal of Christ, the persecution of Christ, all that Jesus did and then his resurrection until the people will know if Jesus did so much for me, what shall I do to become his friend? What shall I do to be saved by him? What shall I do to have my name in his book? What shall I do to become a child of God? That's the reason for the retreat. It's not to gather sinners together and be teaching them doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. No. It's to, our task is to win the lost. Our task is to bring sinners to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to me. We're not competing with other churches. The other churches having retreats or conferences or whatever it is at this time. I don't know whether they understand the task of the church. Our task as Christians. And so we're not comparing ourselves with another church. We're not saying, well, eh, at such and such a retreat held in another place, oh, they taught them doctrine about sanctification, about Holy Ghost, about marriage, about rapture, about great tribulation, about the second coming. No, we're not comparing ourselves with any other church. Our task is to win the lost at this retreat time, to make all the people at that retreat saying, men and brethren, what? What shall we do? And in verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent. You hear that? And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 41. Then, they that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Those were real converts. 
and the state of the church bear that in mind we have seen the task of the church we have seen our task at this coming retreat as Christians and it is very clear that our responsibility is to evangelize people for Christ to enlist people for Christ and to edify people in Christ number one evangelize people for Christ those who have never known, those who have never been told about Christ the Savior, those who have never been saved, evangelize them for Christ. Preach the gospel to them, draw them with the cord of love, bring them to their knees, make them to repent and to call upon the Lord, saying, Oh God, have mercy upon us and save our souls. That's evangelizing the people for Christ. Number two, enlist them for Christ. After they evangelize, they're enlisted. What does that mean? They keep with the church, they stay with the church, they remain with the church, they enlisted for Christ. And that means there will be proper follow-up. That means we'll reach after them, we'll give them the care that they need, the teaching that they need, we'll answer their questions so that all the people that are evangelized for Christ will also be enlisted for Christ. And number three, you edify them in Christ. Now they are in Christ. Now they have given their lives to the Lord. Now you are doing the follow-up. Now they are part of the church. They are to enjoy the church. Uh, do you know something? If the new converts are evangelized and enlisted for Christ, if they come into the church and they enjoy Christ, and they enjoy the Bible, and they enjoy the songs, and they enjoy spiritual things, and they enjoy the church, and they enjoy fellowship, and they enjoy love, and they enjoy care, they will never go back. That's our task as Christians. Evangelize them, enlist them, edify them, so that everyone that comes will really enjoy fellowship with the Lord. Lost sinners must be brought to the place of repentance toward God and faith in Christ. Once a man has been led to Christ, he must be linked to the local church. Our task is not completed until each convert is brought to maturity. Let me go to the second point. I've told you about our task. I go to our target. Our target for converts. Let me read it to you again. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. Verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Go ye therefore teach and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The question is, why are you baptizing them? Because they are now converted. You don't take a sinner and baptize him into the name of the Father. Because that will mean that now he has an identity with the Father. He has a relationship with the Father. He has, uh, you know, this calling and this assurance of sonship with the Father. That's why he's been baptized in the name of the Father and now of the Son. Because the Lord is now his Savior. Jesus is now his Savior. And of the Holy Ghost, because he now has the witness of the Holy Ghost within him. You should never baptize a person until he has assurance of being a child of the Father. Until he knows he is now concretely a follower of the Son. Until he knows that he has the witness of the Holy Ghost. It is because he has assurance of sonship to the Father. He has the link of discipleship to the son and he has a witnessing of the holy ghost within him that now you have the right to baptize him in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost our target as as we go out at the retreat is for converts converts in uh, mark chapter 16 verse 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth that's our target to make them believe believe the gospel believe their sinners believe they need to give their lives to the lord and really do it and give their lives to the lord he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved and he that believeth not shall be damned so we're reaching out for converts in ephesians ephesians 
chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Let me show you this. These are the hands of God. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. They are the hands of God. And they are calling on people in the world, come to the Lord. And how beautiful are the feet of them that publish the good tidings. And Jesus Christ himself has told us that he is giving us all these gifts for one purpose. So that we can call people to him. And when they respond and they pray and they repent from their sins. And they are changed in their lives or transformed in their character and conduct. They become converts. And then verse 12 for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, by the cunning craftiness of men, whereby the lying way to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, to him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say therefore, test and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And so you can see that our, our target is to make sure that converts are brought to the Lord and after they are brought to the Lord, teach them, disciple them, train them. In one word, enlist them so they can become matured in the Lord, standing in the Lord, established in the Lord in Colossians chapter 1. Let me just read to you verse 28. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Whom we preach, talking about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, so that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Matured in Christ Jesus. When Jesus sent forth his disciples and apostles to evangelize the world, he did not commission them merely to preach without any result. And Jesus talked about, he gave us many parables, illustrations concerning the work we are to do. He talked in Luke chapter 15 of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost child. Do you know something? There was not joy, no joy at all, in the heart of the shepherd until the lost sheep was found. There was no joy in the heart of that woman until the lost coin was found. There was no joy in the heart of that father until the prodigal son, the lost son, came back home. And so you understand, in the work of evangelizing, in the work of, uh, you know, preaching the gospel or singing or whatever we're doing at the retreat, there will be no joy until the lost is found. The emphasis is finding the lost. Not only seeking the lost, but finding the lost. If you seek and you do not find, there is no joy. But you know, it is when the sinner that had been lost, it is when he comes back to the fold and he comes back to Christ, it is when there is joy. Then in John chapter 15, he tells us that it's not only to plant the tree, it's not only to have the shade of the tree, the joy is when the tree is bearing fruit. Bearing fruit. Look at John chapter 15. I'm reading verse 8. John 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. It is bearing fruit that brings joy to the Lord. And then, it's not enough to go to the seaside and fish. If you go with an empty net and you come back with an empty net, you have not done anything whatever. 
What the Lord is looking for is that you go with an empty net to the seaside and you are coming back with your net, with your gospel net full of fish for the Lord. So then you understand that as we're having this retreat, the Lord is expecting that, number one, we'll find the lost. Number two, we'll bear fruit and bear much fruit. Number three, we'll fill the gospel net with people. Because he told uh, Peter, he said, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Do you know that to do that you need six things in your life? To be able to effectively do that, I've told you some six things at the beginning, but now I'm going to talk of a father, a mother, a lover, a nurse, a soldier, and a friend. Beautiful illustrations in the epistles concerning who the preachers are, soul winners are, who the Christians are. Just turn quickly with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. It's from that we learn that to achieve the objective of making Christ, of having Christ to be one to the Lord, and maturing those converts and making them like Christ, you need to have the concern of a father. The concern of a father. The concern of a father. Look up at me here. When David heard about the death of Absalom, how did he feel? You can see the passion coming out of him. You can see the concern of a father coming out of him. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, if I would have died instead of you, that's the concern of a father in the parable that Jesus told us of the prodigal son. The prodigal son had been away from home, far away from home, and he was suffering. And every night, the father was looking out. Every time, the father was looking out. And when that child was coming back, and he began to say, My father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I'm no more worthy to be called your child. That father embraced him and removed the dirty clothes upon him. And he replaced everything with things that are clean. That's the concern of a father. And even though Paul, the apostle, was in the prison, he had a yearning, a heart, a desire, a passion towards the Corinthians. And he said, all that I have towards you is the concern of a father. And you know, if you are going to walk at this retreat, that is what you must have. The concern of a father. Not only that, number two, the travail of a mother. The travail of a mother. In Galatians, Galatians chapter 4 verse 19 My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you the travail of a mother the labor pains of bringing to birth that is it you know if, if you want to win souls you cannot do it uh, you know in an easy going manner just shoveling your feet without any without any suffering without any agony in prayer any agony any labor there must be the travail of a mother because the apostle paul said i'm traveling for you again until christ be formed in you the concern of a father do you have it you should the travail of a mother do you have it you should and then the sacrifice of a lover the sacrifice of a lover. You know, that's, that's what it takes. Because except you really love souls, I mean, really love souls, except the chief joy of your life is to see souls born into the kingdom of God as a real lover of souls, you will not want to bring out any sacrifice. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, and I, will gladly, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. 
telling the Corinthians that very gladly I'll spend all I have. I'll give even my very life for your edification because I love you so much even though the more abundantly I love you the less I be loved. And yet you can see within him the sacrifice of a lover. First Thessalonians First Thessalonians, I'm reading chapter 2. From verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as the nurse cherishes her children, delicate children, new children, fainting children, weak children, and the nurse very gently with love and concern will take up that child because of the delicate nature of the child and nurse that child. And Paul the Apostle said, you know we were very gentle, gentle among you, even as they not cherish such our children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not only not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear precious unto us for ye remember brethren our labor and travail for labor in night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you we preach the gospel of god now you must also have the endurance of a soldier in second timothy chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. No man that warreth and tangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And then in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 2. Listen to this. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have espoused you unto one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ you know what Paul the Apostle is saying Paul the Apostle is saying that Jesus Christ is preparing for his wedding and I have the great privilege of going to seek out the bride, the virgin, for the bridegroom. And eventually, I have found you Corinthians. And when I found you, I found you in the mud. I found you in the mire of the world. I found you in the corruption of the Corinthians. I found you in the fields of the world. But then, was the blood of Jesus, was the gospel of Christ, was the washing of water by the word of God, and was the regeneration of the spirit. You have been cleansed, you have been sanctified, and you have been filled with all spiritual gifts. And I'm jealous over you because I don't want that wedding day to come for the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, to put on his, you know, wedding garment and for, the, for everything to be set and then for the bride, for the virgin to be looked for and she is not found. Or she is found but she is dirty. And therefore, I have that jealousy over you. With godly jealousy, I'm watching over you so that when the wedding day will come, you'll be united with Jesus Christ. Listen to me. I've said, if you are going to carry on this work and do it effectively, you need the concern of a father, the travail of a mother, the sacrifice of a lover, the gentleness of a nurse, the endurance of a soldier, and the jealousy of a friend. Uh, you say, but can we have only one of them? As you look at all these references, do you know it's Paul the Apostle alone that has all this? Paul the Apostle alone, who wrote 1 Corinthians, talking about the concern of the Father, Paul. Who wrote Galatians, talking about the travail of a mother, Paul. Who wrote 2 Corinthians, talking about the sacrifice of a lover, Paul. And the jealousy of a friend, the same Paul. Who wrote First Thessalonians and talked of the gentleness of a nurse, the same Paul. Who wrote to Timothy talking about the endurance of a soldier, the same Paul. 
He was a wonderful man. He was a real soul winner. The Lord made him a great evangelist, a great soul winner, a great prophet, a great apostle, a great teacher, and a great pastor. And what God did for Paul, he can do for me and you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. And you know, if we call upon God, he will do it for us in Jesus' name. Amen. I've told you our, our, our task as Christians, our target for convert, now our travail with Christ. Let me show you the heart cry of Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Verse 11. This is the travail of Christ. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear the iniquity. You know, if it were possible again for the Lord to draw aside the curtain of time and to conduct each one of us back to Gethsemane and see Jesus Christ on his knees, see Jesus Christ with his face heavenward, and see him sweating with great drops of blood falling down from his brow and say, Father, if it be thy will, I will drink the cup. If the cup cannot uh, overpass me, I will drink it. Thy will be done. And he prayed long time and hour. And he came to his disciples and, his, and they were sleeping. And he, he went back again and he prayed. That was a travail of his soul. He cried with bitter tears. What was he crying for? was praying for many things too deep you cannot tell too deep it cannot be recorded but no doubt he prayed so that he will go to the cross and give his life and give his blood for the salvation of humanity no doubt he also prayed for his own disciples who were sleeping no doubt he prayed for the world no doubt he prayed for his enemies no doubt the travail of his soul as he knelt in Gethsemane was to see that many will be warned to God the Father as a result of his death for them and he died I said if it were possible for the Lord to draw back the curtain of time the veil that covers us in the 20th century and then he will just make us to see Jesus Christ kneeling down and crying and sweating blood and praying to the Father if you can if you can catch a glimpse of that you will know what it means to travel and then if we travel we are traveling with Christ so that's why we talk about our task as Christians as well as our target for converts and then our travail our travail with Christ let me show you one man Romans chapter 9 from verse 1 I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish, leaves into this, it's a surprise, I could wish myself were accursed from Christ. What was he saying? I wish I could go to hell that the people could go to heaven. Can you think about it? I wish if it were possible, if my being cut off from Christ will bring the people nearer to Christ, I wish I will lose. Even my relationship with Christ be a cost from Christ, cut off from Christ, because of my kinsmen according to the flesh. I wish if it were possible, if it will bring any profit to the children of Israel, my own kinsmen, that I will lose all my enjoyment, all my pleasure, everything that I have, everything that I've got in Christ, if I could lose everything, that these people will be brought to the Lord. Listen to me, a person that is traveling with Christ is not hiding under closed doors, 
is not, you know, clutching after pleasures and, and the luxury and enjoyment. He's not selfish, saying, well, I want to read the Bible for myself. I want to speak in tongues. I want to have more gifts of the Spirit. It's not, you know, going to the mountain somewhere. I want to fast. I want to have more power. He says, even if I don't have anything, the only thing I have now, I want to travel with Christ and be able to win the lost to Christ. And you know, it's a surprise to me. Whenever we come like this on Monday and we finish this first session, and then we say now, if you are a Christian, you wait behind, we want to have a workers' meeting with those who are going to be involved in bringing people to the Lord. And from, the, from what I see, many, many people going back, I can see you don't have the travail that Christ had, that Paul had. The concern of a father, the travail of a mother, the gentleness of a nurse, the endurance of a soldier, the, the jealousy of a friend, as well as the sacrifice of a, of a lover. You don't have these things, and that is why you do not care. All you want is, I want to get healed, I want to get power, I want to get this, I want to get that. But Paul said, I could wish that myself were caused uh, from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Who are the Israelites? To whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenant and the giving of the law and the, sac and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers and of, uh, of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all. God bless it forever. Amen. Look at chapter 10 verse 1. Romans chapter 10 verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God. For Israel is that they might be saved. That's the travail. Psalm 126. Psalm 126. Verses 5 and 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. They that go forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Do you have that travail of the soul? Now, if, if you really get this task and you put your, you put your shoulders to the burden, and then you, you have this target for converts and this travail uh, with Christ, what's the, what's the end result? This is it, our triumph was the captain the captain of our salvation that's Jesus Christ he has tasted death for every man and he has given us life he died so we can live and he has triumphed and if we will do what he wants us to do as we are appointed approved anointed as our approach is simple peaceful and winsome Having the assurance and confidence of faith and having such a radiance of life and radiance of faith as to be acceptable before the people and to God, the end result is certain, will triumph. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Now, thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Every place. Every place. Our faith and confidence in God is that as we approach this coming retreat in every place, in every location, God will make us to triumph. Souls will be saved. The sick will be healed. Miracles will be performed. And mighty signs and wonders will take place. Like the day of Pentecost, we'll see multitudes in their thousands coming.